to welcome everyone to Software Spotlight, your front row seat to the latest innovations in software for small business. I'm Michael Burnswag, your host, and each week we are joined by executives at leading software companies to get an insider's perspective on the emerging technologies, business strategies, and market trends shaping the future. Tune in to stay ahead of the curve on leveraging software to boost your productivity and growth in your business. Be sure to visit our website, softwareoasis.com, to access our free weekly software newsletter and sign up for our upcoming 2024 software webinar series. Today, we are fortunate to be joined by Hakab Sharaben. He's a product and engineering expert and entrepreneur with over a decade of experience in software development, AI, and machine learning. As the founder of HackTech, Hakub helps organizations strengthen their software engineering posture through innovative solutions. He is passionate about leveraging cutting-edge technologies to empower business to thrive in the digital age. So with that, Hakub, welcome to the Software Spotlight. Hi, Michael. Thanks for the intro. Wonderful. We're very happy to have you here today. I know a lot of our listeners have uh, different uh, projects, many may be on the back burner, and they've been looking for the right uh, partner to get some of those projects from the back burner to the front burner so that they can you know, start uh, growing their or continue growing their business. So with that, um, I, would, I was hoping you could share a little bit about your background and your journey and uh, what uh, what brought you to where you are today and a little bit about the company and the solutions you provide. Okay, definitely. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jacob. Uh, I started my career as a software developer having a like, uh, background in applied mathematics and uh, informatics. So I started as a software engineer after working two years. I would say I was a strong junior at that time. I decided to open my own company. Uh, and at that time, uh, it was 2015, it was very high demand for software engineering services. So uh, that's when I come, with, come up with this idea. I uh, started the company and... I successfully grow it to a team of 80 people right now. So I would probably tell that most of our like leadership team, tech leads, uh, even senior developers are much stronger in terms of technology than me. So it's uh, I think it's a very good uh, level to reach. And what we do at Hacktech is uh, we are positioning ourselves as not a traditional outsource or old stuff type of company. What we do is we are becoming an engineering partner for our clients. And the main difference for me uh, personally, because it's very similar to outsource itself, but the biggest difference is more on culture side because our team is becoming part of client's culture, is getting motivated by the impact they are making customers' project, and we usually keep very, very strong personal relationship with our clients. So basically with a team of 80 people, uh, everyone in-house in Yerevan, we just have nine clients right now. So for each uh, client, we are very uh, strong, dedicated team to them. Fantastic. So it does sound like with with a uh, range of engineering talent like that, you really are able to provide an end to end solution for for your partners. And um, are there different areas of um, specialty in terms of um, development that you found your team um, is most adept at, or do you work across industries and, and types of projects? Yeah, actually, by the nature of our work, we are kind of industry agnostic, so it doesn't really matter uh, in which industry we are working. But of course, there are some industries just historically that came that we are having much more experience and having a strong domain knowledge, which definitely a big uh, advantage when starting the project. So I would say like e-government type of projects, especially like visas and this type of process automation. So like legal tech, HR tech a little bit and uh, overall visa automation uh, is one of the things that we are having very good skills. And also most of our projects other than that is going into the category of marketing. So we have like some QR code, uh, URL shortener type of project. We have very big experience in event management platforms, 
like uh, virtual events, in uh, uh, like uh, in-person events and hybrid events. All these we have a couple of very big clients in these industries, and we also have pretty like decent experience in marketplaces. Not like building basic shops, but real complex marketplaces. Very nice. And I guess my question, um, obviously you said that um, your background was in mathematics and engineering, and uh, you've at this point been uh, surpassed by a lot of uh, a lot of your teammates in terms of, uh, you know, you have a lot of talented individuals on staff. But uh, out of curiosity, how did you get your start in software development? Uh, when when you were first getting started, oh, uh, I think like it when I was a kid, I was thinking about that I need to become a game developer. I think many kids had this passion. Sure. So uh, yeah, I went to uh, I applied to this faculty, applied mathematics and informatics. Understood that it doesn't have anything in common with uh, game development because it was very much on mathematics. So it was like I would say ninety percent mathematics and only ten percent. Uh, on like uh, IT itself, but that was a great experience that I gained, I learned, and then uh, mostly myself, I learned some uh, web development techniques. At that time, it was like Node.js, uh, Angular, whatever, and started my first job when I, when I was basically in the first year in the university. Yeah, I think a lot of developers between, you know, Node.js and what led you to start your own company? I think the biggest driver was at that time, uh, it was very popular. Uh, these agencies where they were not really facing the clients, where they working on different freelance individual projects, but at the, uh, like uh, under the curtains, it's a, a company working. So uh, I saw that there is definitely a bigger value that can be created for the clients than what this company is doing. And like I didn't like this agency type of approach where you don't have this personal touch with the company, with the client, etc. So I think that was the main driver that I was thinking that I can do this in a better way. And and one of the things that I noticed um, from some of your existing clients is it sounds like you have pulled together quite a um, company culture internally. It sounds like there's really a feeling of uh, belonging uh, amongst your employees. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you've developed your company culture and, and all of that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, actually, at the beginning, it just uh, came or, uh, organically because at that time, uh, I didn't even know what uh, cult company culture means, like what uh, strategy in terms of the company culture you can put, etc. So it started organically. I was very lucky to have some very loyal and very uh matching people uh, in culture who, who, who still work uh, a tactic and now we are of course having more uh written policies etc we have like our company values that uh we are like keeping we are uh, spreading we are making sure that during the interviews when we are hiring we have like one special interview for only finding out if the person is cultured and matching the company or not. So all these processes now are more organized because they are bigger now, and that's helping to have a, a, a right culture and I would say very low employee uh, churn. Uh, yeah, it's so important, and I can tell you from uh, from my last company that I ran. You know, we had a very long tenure, and the number one reason was the company culture and you know the way that we we took care of our employees and i think that is is so important making sure that uh you know your team is uh not only welcome but well taken care of because at the end of the day you can't be everywhere and doing everything and if you have the right people aboard and they're heading in the right direction and whether it's a, a service-based business like yours where they're taking care of your customers or a product-based business where in the, in the same respect, they're taking care of your customers. Okay. Uh, you're able to, yeah, magnify what, what you're able to do. Now, for one of your clients that, you know, is maybe considering a project that they, uh, you know, know they need to get done, but they don't have the resources internally to complete it. Um, can you talk a little bit about the advantages to outsourcing a project? Um and and what a, an example of a project might might look like, like maybe an existing client, what you're working on for them, and how that that works. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, actually, uh, the, the type of projects we are taking, I would say it's two type of projects. One is digital transformation type of projects where it's a traditional business uh, which doesn't have a software or having some legacy software and they need some uh, automation or some custom software to make their work effective. It's usually like uh, already successful uh, companies reach to some stage that they really care about performance and that for performance there is no tool that they can find in the market so they need something custom. And in this scenario we are uh, our product team is starting the scoping so at the beginning we are not even starting the engineering itself like depending on the complexity it's up to two, three months. Uh, it can be only producting that they are going scoping, understanding the processes, and then uh, creating all this backlog, etc. And only then uh, developers starting. The second type of uh, companies are like traditional IT uh, products. So it's either site as a service, it's a marketplace, or whatever. So um, we have a huge experience there. So it's usually, typically, our clients are either don't have an engineering team, so we are also covering the CTO responsibility at some point because, you know, when you get some people like uh, on a all staff base or whatever, they will not come with the processes unless you have a CTO in place. But when we are coming, we are coming to every new project. We are coming with all this knowledge that we have a tag tech already documented and we are putting this right product management processes, project management processes and engineering and security processes itself. So. That's how we are approaching. Very good. And what would be the advantage for a company to outsource a project versus doing it in-house? There are many advantages, actually, especially in the case when the, uh, like we're working with a type of company where there is a culture match. So I would say one of the uh, like competitive advantages that uh, I can tell is pricing because like uh, being based in Armenia, we are uh, much uh, competitive in terms of pricing than like, uh, for example, US companies. I don't like to bring this as an advantage because there are so many other advantages when I'm trying to do so, but this is for long-term partnership, especially sure. this is a, a great advantage. And the other advantage that, again, we already have a process is we, uh, have a big know-how that we are coming with it and putting in place. So even if the company has a CTO, many of our clients having a local CTO, it's still great to collaborate, understand the way we are doing this uh, engineering and uh, like put these processes in place. Another advantage would be just uh, kind of be uh, still be involved, but also be out of the uh, people management. So yeah, of course they know everyone. Uh, if uh, like our clients want, they are taking part in interviews, whatever, but still they are kind of out of bureaucracy, you know, all these uh, contracts, hiring, uh, all, all these onboarding, etc. So it's uh, another feature of working with a uh, no short team. And what, what is it like, maybe you could walk me through for a company um, that's outsourcing a project to you. What what does it look like from, from when they... they first first get started with the project uh, through to when the project is delivered um, what what are the, the steps along the way what what would be the initial um, kickoff point all the way through to a project being delivered what does it look like yeah actually in most of our projects we don't have the state when it's delivered and it's done because if it's site as a service type of business it's always in the inter- uh, like iteration so there is no really an end so the there, there sure. are just milestones, not actually having the product. But so a lot. So product, you're there for for a company throughout the whole process. Once you've had yeah, their exactly. project live, you're there to support the project and the company. Yeah, actually, right now our clients are so big that it's not even a support. Like we have a company that we are working for eight years, and we are still building different uh, products within the product. So sure. if the business like SaaS business is going good, I can't imagine that it stops the business at some point and goes just to maintenance. But we had that kind of <laughs> experience too. But most of our clients like are long term by na- their nature. So yeah. Well, that says a lot. It says a lot right there. You know, obviously, if clients are sticking around and and yeah. Uh, yeah. working long term. But yeah. So so from a, an initial 
point of contact? How, how would a company initially reach out to you and how does the process get started? What, what would be typical? Yeah, so, so far we didn't have any sales processes. We just grow organically with referrals, not even having a referral bonus so far. So all our clients, they were just so happy, so friendly with us that they, uh, like, I don't know, whenever having drinks with friends or, or whatever, they were talking about us and that's how sure. we grow so far. And actually, that's the reason many of our clients are even located in Seattle because one of the clients was in Seattle, so it's um, all spread uh, through the, uh, their network. And as a key, like starting point, usually the first meeting is with me, just uh, to understand what uh, processes they have, what they actually need, do they need engineering at all or not. And then it's product management, like scoping, understanding what exactly should be done, making it more formal, uh, writing backlogs, etc., and then start all the engineering itself. So basically, we are just making sure that we have at least two sprints backlog before engineers uh, joining the actual process. Okay. So obviously getting a, an initial deliverable finished up and then knowing what the, the roadmap looks like for, for the project with, with your client. And can you give us, I'm not sure if you have a, a client that, that our listeners might be familiar with or just a, a project that, that you're currently working on that you could give a, an example of, of a, a real project that uh, people yeah, may be yeah. familiar with? Yeah, definitely. So, for example, from event management uh, perspective, one of our like best clients, I would say, uh, is Banzai. So it's a, a product portfolio company. They have a couple of products. One of them is Demo, which is a virtual event uh, management tool. Like, um, but uh, we are building also some other nice products for them. Sure. Uh, other than that, we have, for example, Franchise Ramp, which is a big marketing company for franchises and this is a traditional digital transformation type of project where they were they are very successful marketing agency but at some point they needed some automation and we started our partnership there but now we are doing completely different project as well with them in an AI uh, industry so it's a very like um, successful our relationship we are doing uh, we have in our portfolio like legal part which is a big uh, US visa uh, management company so basically you uh, mostly all one type of like this extraordinary ability visas which is a like very long process usually 500 pages of pdf and again we were referred to them they were trying to be more effective like and i would say we reduced the petition creating time for them by like 30 40 percent uh, by implementing the software for them so, wow. so these, these are not small projects. These are, these are diving oh, in with both feet. Yeah. yeah. These are, these are very sophisticated projects you're talking about. Yeah. Very nice. So no, I think that that gives uh, a really clear, clear idea of, of some of the capabilities and, and the mm -hmm. like um, at, at a high level. So it sounds like a lot of your clients may come to you with an initial uh, project that that they know they need to to bring to life, but or they may have a project um, that they already have uh, that they've started internally, but may need um, assistance getting it to to life. Are there different types of programming languages that your team is is you know more adept at than others, or do you work across across languages and and types of, of programming, you know, so if a client may have a project in one language, uh, would it be a good fit for you or not a good fit? Maybe you could talk a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah, definitely. No, we have a stack that we are working with. And I think like company our size, like 80 people, if they tell they are not uh, stack like they are stack agnostic, so they don't care about stack, trying to do everything is not so real because uh, you know, you need to have a domain knowledge like uh, you know, where you are working. So in our case, I would say we are like 50% on Python, like 30% on Node.js and a little bit on PHP. So we started sure. with PHP like uh, we, uh, eight years ago, nine years ago when I started the company, we were doing 100% only like Laravel PHP projects. But yeah. then when we started to work with bigger companies, we saw that Laravel is not so... 
uh, good in terms of like scaling, in, ter in terms of creating like complex mm -hmm. microservice architecture. So we switch to Node.js and Python. So that's uh, our main stake in the back end. On the front end, it's mostly like I'm saying 90% React.js. And on infrastructure side, it's mostly AWS. Actually, we are almost completing to become a AWS certified partner. Uh, and we're still good working with like Google uh, Cloud or Azure sure. because basically the uh, cloud is cloud. So especially yeah. if we are on Terraform and these kind of tools, but uh, or organically it happened the, the way that most of our clients uh, are in AWS. Yeah, I mean, for sure, Azure, Google Cloud, AWS, those are the three three main players that make up the bulk of the cloud computing market. So, yeah, obviously being able to work across, you know, technologies and platforms is is very important. What what are you seeing for, for trends in software development from where you, you sit? Uh, you mean in terms of stack languages or in terms of like uh, the uh, more high level things? Yeah, just industry. higher level trends. Like, what, what are you seeing? Yeah, AI definitely. So, uh, actually, I was uh, two weeks ago, I was in Qatar taking part in Web Summit. It's a huge, uh, nice, very well organized event. And I would say sure. every company having this AI next to their name. So, uh, we yeah. were even making progress. Okay. Like if you have a couple of if else statements or if you're integrating GPT, it doesn't mean that uh, you are an AI startup. But yeah, yeah, definitely AI is a big trend and everyone trying, which is definitely a smart solution, like uh, <clears throat> everyone trying to adopt it somehow into their existing business and their existing products. Very nice. So yeah, no, that, that is a major trend. And I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of... Um, software solutions, you know, integrate more and more capabilities. I think, you know, as, as companies are looking to strengthen their, their bottom line, you know, a lot of companies are looking to uh, narrow down their, their stack of uh, solutions that they're, they're subscribed to and really, you know, finding solutions that can deliver more value, maybe almost like a, uh, you know, a, a single tool that uh, acts acts like many. So I think that's another trend that we're seeing on this end. But uh, that's that's great. Now, as far as um, your engineers and development teams, um, what are you seeing as as you know challenges that um, you know as as you've grown as an organization? What what types of challenges are you seeing that uh, are opportunities to to overcome? Yeah, actually, I think for us, we had a couple of big like challenges. First was when we reached 20 people. So at that point, you understand that uh, what means to run a company. So until 20, 25 people, you can not have many critical roles. At least it happened to us. So we didn't have an HR. We didn't have a, a like a proper positioning tech leads, etc. But we uh, reaching like 25 and more, you are understanding that these ro roles are crucial. Now, you don't even understand how you could work without these roles. So one was sure. when we reached 25. I would say the second wave for us was uh, reaching this phase because we basically uh, doubled within a year. So like uh, within one year, we doubled from 40 people to almost 80 people. And in this case, you are having a lot of chaos because, again, lack of processes, lack of like uh, proper uh, document documenting processes, etc. So uh, I think we are now in a stage that we uh, passed this uh, wave as well. So we are feeling very comfortable at this size. Everyone knows what they are doing. And now I think it's the perfect time for us to really start growing more rapidly. Yeah, and that, that's great. And what what would you attribute your growth to? Would you say because it, it sounds like you don't have a ton of of clients, um, but some some substantial clients. Would you say the growth is coming from your existing clients or from adding new clients or a little bit of both? Yeah, actually both. Uh, for existing clients, unless they do some new business or have a rapid growth, I don't expect the like team size or budgets. To uh, change rapidly, so it's mostly like I would say maybe ten to twenty percent of growth with existing clients finding out new opportunities, and most Great. growth is from 
uh, products which still right now coming to our existing clients. So, okay. So it sounds like you're poised and, and ready to, to grow as, as an organization and you have the structure in place to do that, which is so important. Um, you know, if you were talking to aspiring software engineers that are maybe just graduating for, from school or looking to get their start in engineering, um, obviously it's a, it's a fast changing field in terms of the technology. What would you suggest to engineers that are just getting started as as a, a good starting point for you know getting involved in engineering? Yeah, uh, definitely. I would say that they need to have this growth mindset, continuously working on them. And uh, I would give this uh, thing that, for example, five years ago, you could just go to some, even not having a proper background, many people were just going to like six months classes and then starting their career as a software engineer. But now, especially the last two years after like COVID and then uh, the wars in the world, etc., the market is changed. So uh, the there is no such big high demand as it was like five years ago, in my opinion. So uh, now as a junior, as a fresh starter, you need to prove that you uh, you want to enter this field, you want to grow, and you need to continuously work on yourself. Like, uh, don't think that going to some uh, training for six months or whatever can uh, guarantee you a, a space in a company when you are in a position. And are there certain areas of development, you know, front-end development, back-end development, DevOps, you know, are there certain areas that you see the most demand uh, for engineers that are just uh, coming out of school? Mm, I think, no, I think the demand is the uh, same for all of them. So when someone asking me this, I'm starting to talk to them to find out uh, what they actually want to do. Because, like, you can't just become a front-end developer because you think there is more job on front-end or in reverse. Right. So you need to understand, like, for example, for me, I'm more a uh, back-end guy. I don't, uh, for me, if it's working, it's perfect. And I have this thing that I like more complexity, etc. But yeah. uh, there are some people who don't like all this and like more, like, perfectly looking, uh, smooth, stream, better UX, etc. So it just depends on what you uh, have a passion for so I so believe really... yeah yeah also the starting point usually is the same so even if you are a backend developer you are starting the same uh, stack as a front end one so you just need to enter the field uh, explore more and then understand which part makes more uh, sense for you where you feel more comfortable and from where you sit um, does a good engineer make a good product manager or is it a very different skill set uh, no i think it's a different skill set yeah okay and and for project managers that that you have working internally um or again maybe for someone coming out of school what what are some of the important uh, details to being successful as a product project manager yeah, for project manager, I think the most important thing is the soft skills. So you can learn how to use Jira, you can learn uh, how to uh, create tickets, you can learn all that stuff, but you need to have these all the necessary soft skills to manage the team. So it's uh, not everyone. Like every, I, I believe everyone can work hard and become an engineer, but uh, not everyone can become a project manager because you need to have this... Uh, uh, in yourself, so you need to have that soft skills in place. And for product manager, I think the most important thing would be creativity, because it's kind of business decision making role, working directly with the stakeholders, and seeing market, understanding where the market is going, communicating it to stakeholders. So you need to have some business knowledge and also some uh, like creativity. So, so for a project manager, it's really juggling a lot of competing. Um, you know, forces in terms of, you know, you may be pulled in a lot of different directions and have limited resources. You need to allocate those resources to get the, the jobs accomplished. Are, and are you saying that, that engineers may not always be the easiest to work with for a project manager? And they need to, uh, need to make sure that they're, they're able to, you know, uh, juggle, you know, a, a variety of personalities and a variety yeah. of, complexities yeah i think it's everywhere like just deal, 
dealing with people, with humans, it's always hard because you need to consider, like, you need to have very high sense of empathy to really understand right. what's going on with this person. I think the uh, reason why it's, it's just more competition in IT and it's more, uh, like, culture in IT. That's why uh, usually when talking to empathy, talking to people, etc., it's people thinking about, like, IT type of business, but... Uh, usually you should have these problems and you should have the empathy, et cetera, et cetera, in all types of businesses when dealing with people. Sure. No, that makes makes a lot of great sense. And for different uh, projects that you're working on, do you typically have um, a, a single point of contact with each of the organizations or would there be multiple points of contact um, for an external organization? How How do you work that type of relationship? Yeah, usually depends on the size of the company. From our side, usually it's me and also the, uh, I would say, project manager, product manager, and tech lead of the team that dedicated to this client. And from client side, usually, uh, again, depending on the size, it might be CEO. If it's a small company, it might be CTO. It might it might be engineering manager. So it depends sure. on the size of the company. So, so you may have a small team that's interfacing with each organization uh, rather than than having having multiple you know, points of contact. So that that makes a lot of a lot of good sense, and I think that's that's very helpful. Um, so, as far as your key takeaways for companies that are listening to uh, listening to our conversation, that may be saying to themselves, "Wow, it sounds like maybe we need to explore," uh, you know. You know, getting a project uh, started with uh, Hackab and his team. What would be the um, the next step in terms of uh, of getting started? Yeah, I think just reaching out to me um, in LinkedIn. That's where I'm most active, spending most sure. of my time. So yeah, okay. uh, just and starting. We'll, we'll obviously, we'll we'll leave a, a link in the show notes yeah, for anyone. So we're starting a conversation. LinkedIn. We'll have an exploring call. We'll understand what. Uh, they exactly need, and then uh, it, it will take from there. Because we are having many cases when someone contacted us and telling, hey, uh, I have big budget and I want to do like uh, this project, but we are seeing that it's it really doesn't uh, make sense to spend that amount of money in this project. There are many like alternatives. There is already a solution, so we are trying to be very transparent, not just to win a deal, but really give value to the client and tell, hey, you know, there is this tool which is solving exactly the problem you have, so you don't need to build it from scratch, for example. Yeah, so obviously there's a lot of times where, where a company can find a solution that that was already developed to meet their needs and uh, you're looking out for their, their best interest. Makes sense. So, um, well, I really appreciate your joining us on Software Spotlight today. I think that was really a helpful uh, conversation and I know a lot of our our uh, you know community members are absolutely uh, you know looking for different kinds of solutions and development, and we have a lot of um, programmers and the like that that visit our website. So who knows? As you continue growing, maybe maybe we'll have some people that we can refer over to you. So really appreciate <laughs> you're taking the time out today. Uh, coming up on our next episode, we have uh, Ian Laffin. Uh, she's a seasoned marketing strategist and content creator specializing in helping startups and founders navigate the complex world of marketing. With extensive experience across industries, Ian brings a wealth of knowledge to her role as founder of Finn Marketing Management. She is a passionate uh, individual about crafting compelling narratives and driving growth strategies for innovative marketing. So be sure to visit our website, softwareoasis.com, to access our free weekly software newsletter and sign up for our upcoming 2024 weekly webinar series.